Zdravím. At any rate, I'm going to uh, offer you uh, sort of a half political, half technical talk. I hope this, uh, you'll find some amusement in this. Uh, so I want to talk about data science. Um, I should say, I've been recently involved in um, something called the uh, Data Science Education Roundtable. And it's, it's run by the statisticians, and it's... Um, it's given me a, um, a sense that the statistics world is trying very hard to claim data science as its own. So um, my, my answer to the question, is it just statistics? No, no, it's it obviously not. I'm going to try to argue that. Uh, you also, um, to many people, data science is machine learning. Um, and I'm going to try to argue that it's not just that either, although obviously it's an important uh, uh, component. Uh, but then I want to spend a good deal of time in this, this talk showing you two algorithms that are not machine learning and yet are very important for uh, big data analysis. Uh, so let's see. Uh, first thing, maybe about the year 2000, uh, maybe a little bit before, uh, the term data mining became very popular. Everybody had to say they were doing data mining. And then maybe 10 years later, uh, you had to say you were doing big data. And now, you have to say you're doing data science. Okay, well, uh, what I'm saying is, while the, the names have changed, I don't think that the uh, idea has changed. I think that we are still talking about problems, problems that require <coughs> the largest available hardware, uh, the, best, the, the best programming systems, the best algorithms. By, by programming systems, I mean things like, like Hadoop or Spark or Giraffe, or these, these specialized uh, systems for doing parallel computing without actually having to do any any parallel programming. Um, and uh, again, using all of this good stuff to, um, to solve problems, uh, often in, it, it's a, a, in one of the domain sciences or uh, certainly commercial applications very important as well. Okay. How about, how about that? Is that good? Okay. Um, anyway, so as, as I said, if you talk to a machine learning person, they tell you that data science is, is, is just machine learning. And um, uh, statisticians, uh, again, my, my sense, I'm going to go into this in a, in a, in a moment, uh, statisticians see statistics as the central science of data science. It isn't. Okay. Um, well, my background is really database systems. And, and uh, to me, data science looks like uh, exactly what database people have been doing all along, uh, except because data has gotten bigger, machines have gotten bigger, everything's gotten bigger. So we can do much more than we could do 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, but again, to me, I, what I want to argue is that it just, it's just the, the evolution of database systems uh, research. <coughs> uh, uh, and in particular, I, I claim that if you want to be a data scientist, um, you, um, uh, you don't start out as a statistician. You start out as a computer scientist. You take the core of, uh, of, of computer science education, and you specialize that uh, for you know, taking courses that uh, enable you to handle large-scale data, which include things like machine learning, sir. Okay. Now, uh, here, here's where I start going, uh, going crazy. This is a diagram that statisticians love to um, show you as an explanation of what they think data science is. Um, this was done by uh, uh, Drew Conway, 
Uh, and by the way, where did I get this from? I actually copied it. There's a Wikipedia article entitled Data Science Venn Diagram. This is the first one. There are lots more. I'll give you mine in a second. But anyway, th this is, a, a, oddly enough, um, uh, Drew Conway, by the way, was a student in political science at NYU when he, when he drew this. So, so uh, what gives him the, the authority? I don't know, but that's, again, the statisticians love this. They're always showing this. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, if you think about it, everything about this diagram is wrong. And I want to go over that. Okay, small uh, problem. Uh, I would say domain knowledge is, is the proper term instead of substantive expertise. But in other words, in order to do data science, you have to know something about the application or collaborate with somebody who, who knows uh, the application. Um, now, th this is an ugly thing. Okay. Um, he basically dismissed all of computer science as hacking. Okay. The, um, you know, well, I'm, I, I don't agree. Uh, you know, it's computer science, and uh, computer science is very little of it. It's about writing code. It's about algorithms and and uh, important models and ideas. Uh, all of all of the good stuff that, that we know uh, computer science contains. Okay, but there's more. Okay. What he considers the danger zone is when you take a computer scientist and someone who knows the application, and the computer scientist, in his terms, hacks, but, but basically solves the problem without the wise guidance of a statistician. Okay. Well, I'm going to claim, and I'll give you at least some examples, of that most data science work actually exists in, 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 this, in, in this region of the Venn diagram, and it works, and it's important. Um, then there's this notion. Uh, his definition of traditional research is uh, you apply mathematics and statistics to some application domain, but you don't write any code. Okay? You don't actually solve a problem. You just do math about it, or statistics about it. Um, you know, I mean, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's in somebody's tradition, but I, I certainly don't want to see it as, as part of, a, of my tradition, and I don't think it should be taken seriously as a, uh, a, a way to do, to do data science. Uh, then there's this. Machine learning is applications uh, 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 it's mathematics hacked, if you will, that is code written about the mathematics, but with no application. And I don't know how many of you are in machine learning, but I don't think it describes what anybody in machine learning is actually doing. All right, so, so there's that. They have no relation to data science at all. <coughs> okay. Now, that's not to say that there aren't electrical engineers or mechanical engineers who are functioning as computer scientists and, and who are actually <coughs> participating in the world of data science. But you have to be a computer scientist to do that. Um, oh, yeah, please, you know, I, I, it's fine. Whenever I give this talk, I get a lot of arguments that's great. Uh, please feel free to interrupt uh, when, when, whenever, whenever you, you, you wish. I'm hoping to have some time to talk at, uh, at the end to, to, to discuss things as well. Um, okay, so here's my, my, my Venn diagram. I don't think it's made it into the Wikipedia article yet, but uh, it should. Uh, okay, so there's computer science, and then there's domain science. And at least the good part of their intersection, I won't say the whole um, intersection, is, is what data science is all about. Okay. Now, where does machine learning fit in? It's a 
branch of computer science, pretty fairly big, pretty uh, fairly big part of it, maybe not that big, but I needed space to write machine learning. Um, and some of it has applications to data science, and there are lots of other applications that aren't data science. Um, where do math and statistics fit in? Um, I see it like this. And, and as it says, that the bubbles are not to scale. Um, in, in when you have five bubbles and you want to get a particular set of intersections, and, uh, you, you have to be a little bit careful how you do the sizing. Um, what, what my, my point is, that math and statistics don't really apply to the domain except as they inform computer science. It's sometimes machine learning and lots of other things. That is, computer science has always built and used a lot of mathematics, used a lot of statistics. No question about that. They are very important tools. Uh, you know, things like, like many of the best algorithms, for example, are randomized algorithms. You have to know about statistics in order to, to be sure that your algorithm actually converges to the right answer. Uh, so you need, you need to know math and you need to know statistics in order to be a, 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 a good computer scientist. But the math and the statistics get used by computer science and it's the computer science that actually solves the problem. Anyway, so that's that's where I um, where I, 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 I stand. Okay, so let's let's take a little look. Um, okay, first of all, as far as statistics are concerned, they're, again, they're, I, I want to start off by you know saying what's good about it. Okay? You really do need statistics. Uh, I mentioned randomized algorithms. Um, uh, sometimes you have a, a non-randomized algorithm, but it's applied to, to data that is itself kind of random, and you want to know um, what is the expected running time, for example. You need to, you need to know statistics. Um, and uh, there are even certain applications where statistical validity of your conclusions uh, are, are important. Uh, just as an example, um, if you analyze the uh, census data, and you um, announce that the data supports a statement like 10% of the population of this region uh, is below the poverty level, um, people have, have to understand what that actually means because, you know, money flows or doesn't flow depending upon what that, what that means. So you have to be able to distinguish between, yeah, probably less than 50% or 95% probability that it is between 9 and 11%. Um, okay. So anyway, these are just a couple of examples where, um, where statistics is really important. But here's the, um, the problem. Data science is basically an experimental science. You, uh, you design an algorithm, you want to see how it works, Try it out, um, and you know if if the performance isn't what you want it to be, you try something else. Um, and um, you see, again, it's it's this this the, the Drew, Drew Conway's view that you have to have a statistician supervising the work. I, you know, I, I think it's it's it's. It's nonsense because there are lots of reasons why you want to deploy your algorithm, even if you're not sure that it's the best possible, or, or even knowing just how how good it is, or, or what the chances are that it's going to it's going to give you the right answer. You just do the, doing the best you can is more important than than knowing how well you're doing. Um, Anyway, I just want to say that you know, I, I know a number of statisticians who have made real contributions to data science, but the contributions they make are algorithmic. They're really becoming computer scientists in, in, in what they do. And those are, those, those are the, 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 the people who are going to have, uh, going to have impact. Um, so 
Uh, just to give you, give you an ex example of why it's important to do the best you can without knowing how well you're doing. Uh, uh, if, you, if you notice, um, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you use Gmail, probably everybody in the room does. Uh, you, um, uh, th th they're pretty good. You never really see a phishing attack. Or if you do, it's, it's got this big red banner over it that says, don't do this. Uh, so so we, we know they're pretty good. Uh, how good are they? Um, it's really impossible to tell. And even if you had this analyzed in some uh, you know, statistically valid way today, since the fishers are changing their tactics all the time. It wouldn't tell you anything about tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and you know, and, and you know, let, let's first of all let, let's let's be realistic. The algorithms that Google uses undoubtedly have within them a lot of sophisticated mathematics and statistics, but they're algorithms; they're not statistics. So if you believe that, you know. Hacking applied to this domain is in the danger zone in the in the Conway's uh, terms. Um, you know, I I claim it's more important that you not put a phishing email in front of some guy who's going to follow it and, and, and lose all their money. Uh, right. Um, anyway. Um, you know, and I'll give you, give you some, uh, just a just quick, quick collection of, of other examples. Uh, uh, it, it appears now that your genome tells uh, physicians a lot about what medications will work, what treatments will work, and what, what won't. Uh, but we're just in the, in the infancy of, of, this, of this sort of science. Uh, we certainly don't know everything about it, and we certainly don't know the probabilities involved, but, you know, it's better than nothing, it, and, and to do the best we can is, is very important. It saves lives. Um, uh, predicting hurricanes, another, uh, another way. We have, um, uh, unfortunately, because hurricanes, one of the things that Israel doesn't have to worry about. But um, you know, in the United States, we certainly do. And, and when a hurricane's coming by, they give you sort of an envelope of where it's probably going to go. But they never really know until it hits. Okay. But it's better, at least, to know that there's a chance that a hurricane's coming your way than to just wake up one morning and find that your house is no longer uh, over you. Um, uh, you know, and even in a more, the more, from the, you know, with the more, da more mundane applications, just even uh, predicting ads or uh, Netflix trying to uh, predict the movies you would, uh, you would like to watch, uh, they're not perfect. And, you know, the, the statistics probably don't matter that much, but, uh, Google and Facebook and Netflix and so on, they're all always trying to do as do better than they the, the, than they did the, 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 the month before. And eventually they'll, they'll, they'll you know, they, they, they make progress. Um, okay. Now, um, now let's, let's, let's attack machine learning for a minute. Okay. Um, okay, now, now again, let, let me you know, state, I am not an anti-machine learning person. Uh, I, I think that there are uh, absolutely uh, many important problems where, where machine learning is exactly what you want to do. And even in situations where there are other approaches, often the machine learning approach um, is, is better, uh, it gives you, gives you better results uh, than, than non-machine learning approaches. And I'll, I'll give you one example to talk about association rules in a second. But, but first, I want to show you this. Everybody know what the Gartner curve is? It's, it's this idea that any technical idea 
Uh, people get more and more excited about it until it reaches uh, the peak of what's called the hype, the, the, the peak of, of hype, where, where it's just vastly over, uh, overrated as, as to how, how important it is. Uh, and then, uh, and by the way, I see people taking pictures. I, I, the slides are available, so I, you probably don't have to uh, take pictures of it. You're welcome to, if, if you do. Um, the, um, again, then the idea is, OK, after the hype, people noticed that it wasn't as good as the hype said it would be, so they just get kind of disappointed, and then it, re it reaches the, the, the trough of despair. And then finally, people begin to understand the technology, and they understand where it works and where it doesn't work, and the value sort of goes up, but never as high of course, as, as the hype. Now, what's at the top of the hype cycle? I don't know if you can read that, but it's uh, to the two dots are, are machine learning and deep learning. So that's that's not a that's not a good thing. Um, now I, again, I, I'm sure that machine learning will turn out to be a really important idea. I don't want to say it won't, but uh, I worry that that it's being over overly hyped. Uh, so here are, here are the three objections. Uh, Okay, first of all, machine learning isn't as big as you think it is because there are a lot of <coughs> ideas that pre-existed machine learning uh, and were developed by other communities uh, and are yet claimed by many machine learning people to be machine learning. Uh, two good examples of clustering, which is often, um, is often referred to as a, a branch of um, um, of unsupervised learning. Okay. A gradient descent. This is something operations research people were, were, were doing uh, 70 years ago. I think. Um, association rules. This is something that came out of the database community that we're going to talk about later. Okay, so that's one problem. An another one is what machine learning solves problems by creating models. Well, I'm going to try to give an example that not everything you do in this world is finding a model. And then the, the, the third thing is, is the issue of understandability, which is becoming more, more important as, as, as time goes on. Uh, and I, and I, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Well, um, first of all, association rules. Um, if you've never, uh, never seen them, they are uh, they're if-then rules that you, you discover by looking at a large amount of, da of data. Um, the original application was counting co-occurrences of items that you bought in, the, in a the market basket. So when you went uh, up to the, the checkout line at a supermarket, uh, you would, um, uh, you know, they, they would, the register would, would uh, would know, uh, would record everything that you bought together. And so if you bought bread and butter together, they would, they would know, gee, a lot of people, when they buy bread, they also buy butter. Uh, and this is something that came out of the database community in, in the 1990s. Um, uh, in, the ter in terms of phishing attacks, uh, you might think that items uh, in the, that could be in the baskets are, are, uh, are the words in, in, in the email. Uh, and you might uh, analyze uh, known phishing emails uh, and discover that when an email contains both the word Nigerian and Prince uh, in the same email, then it's likely to be a phishing attack. Well, the fact is that, um, that this approach, while it works, uh, doesn't give you quite the accuracy. So it's off by a couple of percent. Uh, on the accuracy of even a, a simple linear model where, let's say, you learn a weight for each word, it could be positive or negative, and then you decide whether an email is uh, phishing or not by summing the weights of all its words, and you'll be called, say, call it phishing if, it's, if the sum is, it is positive. Okay, the trouble is, uh, okay, 
that its association rules are understandable. Okay, so, you know, if some Nigerian prince calls up Gmail and, and asks, you know, why aren't you letting any of my, uh, my emails go through? At least there's a clear explanation. Um, you know, on the other hand, I don't know if you've ever looked at a spam email and asked Gmail why it's spam. It will tell you. Well, sometimes it's got a reason, but most of the time what it says is something like, it looks like other emails that, that we think are spam. What that means is, whatever <laughs> model it is we're using today, and it's too complicated to bother explaining to you, um, it, that model classified it as spam. In other words, don't ask us, just trust them. Uh, and again, they, they're pretty good at it, no, no question. But, um, but, no, but it's not an understandable model. Now, that may not matter to you. All you really want to do is make sure that the spams wind up in your spam folder and nothing else winds up in your spam folder. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if, say, an insurance company is using some mysterious model to um, decide what your uh, automobile insurance should be, and they suddenly reclassify you in some mysterious way, uh, and your insurance premium goes up, that's, you know, that's a little bit frustrating. <coughs> and in fact, uh, I understand now that in Europe, you're just not allowed to do that. So. Um, Again, I, what, what I, my, my, my belief is that machine learning is appropriate when, first of all, it's got to be a problem involving a model because that's what machine learning does for you. And um, the issue of explanation has to be, uh, you have to be able to handle that. That is, you, you can avoid having to explain to people what it is that the model does. Uh, and in addition, it's appropriate when you don't really understand the underlying technology. Uh, you know, my canonical example, there was a company, Wizbang Labs, started by a former a stu student at, at Stanford. Uh, and, and this was, you know, many years ago, he thought he was going to solve problems using machine learning. And he actually hired some of the top machine learning people uh, uh, at, of, of the time. Uh, and uh, his plan was to uh, use machine learning to identify people's resumes on the web. So he could gather, you know, I'll gather millions of resumes and I'll build a, um, a job searching site so that a company could come and ask for candidates and then they would be able to find exactly the people who, uh, who this company wanted. Well, they, they actually went bankrupt and the reason they went bankrupt is because they, uh, you, you can't really beat natural intelligence on this problem because everybody understands what a resume looks like. You know, if it says previous job, any document that says previous jobs held, there's a very good chance it's a resume. And, and, you know, a couple of other rules like that, just right off the top of your head, were actually able to beat the best that they could do with machine learning. But how many resumes could it how many resumes? Oh, well, well, they found millions. But, but you don't, but you know, the point is you, it, once you, you don't have to read them all. You just, you just use rule, you just write down the rules, the phrases that you're going to look for, and if, it, the, it, you know, then you let the computer look for the phrases. So the computer's going to go chew through the res the, all the web pages, not just, it's more, it, the computer will chew through the web pages and decide which one's a resume based on, on some simple rules that you write down. And that beats what was bang. Okay. Um, okay. So with that, let me, let me do the, um, the technical part of the talk. And I want to just talk about two algorithms, uh, families of algorithms. Uh, one is locality-sensitive hashing and the other is, is approximate counting. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to um, 
mention that if you're interested in these, there's a free book, and here's the link um, uh, that, that covers this and a lot of other things. Um, and there's also a MOOC, which the same authors developed. Um, I'm not expecting you to memorize this link. Uh, but if you just, just Google um, uh, mining of massive data sets, uh, MOOC or something, uh, you'll, you'll get it. Um, Okay, now, locality-sensitive hashing is an algorithm that you use when you need to compare each pair of items from, from some reasonably large set of items and find those pairs that are similar. Okay. Um, so uh, I just want to just talk about it in terms of, of one example where it's called, uh, the technical term is entity resolution. And it says, um, uh, if you're given a set of, of records, let's say the, re the entities could be anything, but let's say they're people. So the records might have uh, people's names and their phone numbers, their addresses, and so on. Uh, you want to find those pairs of records that are likely to refer to the same person. Now, uh, OK, the, the, the problem is two people Sorry, two records could refer to the same person, and yet the names are not quite the same. Um, one might have their middle name, the other might not. Uh, there can be misspellings, that, that kind of thing. Uh, same with phone numbers and, 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 and addresses and so on. Um, but uh, now the, the problem. Uh, I mean, it's fairly easy to come up with a scheme that sort of rates the similarity of two records. Um, but what's, what's hard in this case is comparing all pairs of records. The trouble is, let's say, if you have even a set of a million records, that's a pretty small set by today's standards, uh, you've got half a, a trillion, or five times 10 to the 11th, roughly, um, pairs. Now, Comparing half a trillion of anything is going to take time, it's going to take computing resources. That's going to be your bottleneck. Okay. And it's got nothing to do with the models. I mean, you're going to have, in some sense, you're going to have a model of what it means to be similar. But that's not the hard part. The hard part, part is doing the uh, comparison. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you have n records, what I'd like to do is get better than um, n squared performance. And you can do that as long as you're willing to accept a few false negatives. Okay, that is, you will occasionally miss a pair of similar records and not, and, and not merge them. Uh, and the trick is this. Uh, we need some, some hash functions that are going to, well, each hash function, we're going to use several different hash functions. But each hash function is going to throw all of the items into buckets. In this case, all the records uh, into buckets. And what we want is that if items are similar, rep represent the same person in this case, uh, then there's a good chance that they're going to wind up in the same bucket for any given hash function. And if they're not similar, they will most likely wind up in different buckets. Well, we're going to again use many different hash functions. Uh, in my example, we'll just use three. But um, uh, the candidate pairs are those that wind up in the same bucket in at least one of the hashing. And what you hope is, and if if these conditions one and two uh, are are satisfied, then most pairs that are not similar will never wind up in the same bucket, and they'll never get compared. And if they are similar, then there's a really good chance that at least once they will wind up in the same bucket. So uh, for example, what, uh, again, assuming that our records are about people, uh, we might uh, just hash records by the name. So if the names are identical, then they're in the same bucket. 
if they differ in even one letter, they're not in the same bucket. Okay. So, you know, again, we will miss those pairs where it's really the same person, but somehow the names are a little bit different. There's, again, maybe there's a misspelling or uh, something like that. But we'll hope if they really represent the same person, they should also have the same phone number, the same address, and so on. So we hope that at least one of these hashings will put the two records in the same bucket. So uh, again, we might hash again on phone, va on, on phone values. Uh, that should get things pretty much in the same bucket if and only if they are um, the same person. But, you know, there, there'll, be, there'll be typos. Sometimes you had a phone number, then you gave it up, and somebody else takes that same phone number. So, you know, you might get some uh, two records in the same bucket, even though they're really different people. Uh, but you're going to check that out anyway, so you'll probably discard that as, as a pair. Um, and then, you know, you can, you can do this on address and, and um, a social security number or, or, or any, any number of other things that the records have. And then, as I said, we're going to hope that two records that represent the same person are going to wind up at least once, at least one of the hashing, uh, in, in, the same, uh, in the same bucket. And if the records representing different people will never just accidentally wind up in the same bucket. Um, and then, you know, I think as, as I said, just because two records wind up in the same bucket, that just suggests that they might be the same person. You still need to check out the, uh, the pair. Well, the second, uh, the second story is approximate counting. Um, so the model is we have a stream of elements coming in of some sort. And you want to count the number of distinct elements. So simple example, um, Facebook. Uh, they like to publish how many distinct users there were in a month. So you think of the stream as the, um, uh, a, a, the stream is the login to Facebook, the, uh, the identity of, of, the, of the, the person who logged in. And you want to count not how many logins there were, but how many distinct uh, IDs uh, were logged in. And so there's a simple example. You just keep a hash table. Uh, when, a, when, a new ID, when, an, when an ID comes in, when someone logs in, you hash that ID. If, the, uh, if it was already in the hash table, then you don't count it again. If it wasn't in the hash table, then you add it to the hash table and you add one to the count of distinct users. Okay? And that works. Uh, it works. The trouble is, I mean, Facebook has uh, uh, two billion uh, users or something. So the hash table is going to use a lot of space. That's not uh, a big problem for Facebook, but I want to talk about one more example where uh, the, uh, the hash tables themselves don't, aren't very large, but there are so many of them that you can't possibly keep them all around. Uh, so uh, the idea is this. A company like Google or, or Bing will crawl the web. Now, you can't actually crawl all the pages of the web. There are simply too many of them. So um, after they've gone out, you know, maybe 10 hops, uh, they start being a little bit um, conservative about, do I want to look at this page and follow its links to see where it goes? And um, they have to start prioritizing. They want to only follow the links in, in certain pages that are likely to be important. And sort of intuitively, what they want is to follow links only in high page rank. Okay. But the trouble, of course, is you can't compute the page rank uh, until you've actually completed the crawl. So uh, what they will do is approximate the page rank by just the number of in-links that they have found so far. So what they're doing is really counting um, for each page that they visited, count the number of distinct, uh, uh, the distinct predecessors. Okay. 
and I might add, again, this is, uh, they can only get an approximation to the count, but that's kind of okay because the whole thing is just the heuristic. Okay, so, you know, you're just gonna, you're trying to guess which pages are worth, uh, worth examining. Um, you know, so the approximation to the count is probably okay. So now I want to talk about the, 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 uh, what's called the Flagellet-Martin algorithm. Um, and uh, what this does is it, it's going to give you an approximation to the count of distinct uh, elements, but it'll use much, much less space than a, a, a table, a hash table listing all the elements that you've seen so far. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep um, some number of variables, so let's just say 100. Now each variable is a small integer, and by small I mean really small. Uh, five bytes, so you, as you, you, when you look at this, you'll, you'll see that five bytes is plenty for, e for each integer. So if you want 100 variables, that's uh, 500 bytes, that's about 500 bits, 500 bits, uh, which is what, about 60 some odd uh, bytes. Okay. So let, let's just look at one of these, say, 100 variables, call it these. Now there's an associated hash function. And what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna hash each input that we see to uh, to some uh, to a bit string, and the tail length of a bit string is just the number of consecutive zeros at the end. So half the bit strings have a tail length of zero because they end in a one. Uh, another quarter of them have a tail length of one because they end in one zero, and, and so on. Uh, so the tail lengths tend to be very small. Um, but we want v to record the largest tail length seen so far. That's one one variable. So you have say 100 different hash functions. Each hash function has an associated variable, and each variable is uh, recording the largest tail length seen so far according to that hash function. Now, what you have to realize if if the largest tail length that you've, you've ever seen is r then, uh, the, uh, again, according to the hash function for some variable v, then what you want to, you want to guess that you've seen two to the r different values. And the, the intuition here is, is that uh, if you've seen two to the r different values, and since there are only two to the r different tails of length r, you've probably seen every possible tail of, of that length. Uh, so there's a good, good chance, in particular, that you've seen R zeros. Um, you've seen much less than two to the R values. The chances of seeing that one of those tails has, R, has any particular string of length R, in particular uh, R zeros, is, re is relatively small. Well, I'm not going to go into it, but uh, you have to combine the estimates. Again, you have 100 different variables. You have to combine them. Uh, neither the average nor the median is, a good, is, 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 going to, is accurate enough. You have to combine them in a funny way, but you can get uh, an accurate estimate. By accurate, I mean the more variables you use, the closer you come to the true value. Okay, so let me just conclude. Uh, as I said, data science I see as a natural evolution of what's been going on in computer science for years, uh, in particular in, in the database system. Um, you know, the statisticians, you know, they're sort of right, but, but the, their, their problem is that they, they worry too much about playing with the numbers and not enough about solving problems. And then machine learning, well, it's, it's a big part of data sci science, uh, machine learning is not everything in data science. And now I guess I'm happy to have a discussion. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, maybe I have a question. So, what about the
the implication of on the economy. How it will influence the profession in the market. Well, in a sense, um, that I mean, that you know, the, the demand for data science is really large. Because of the, because of the market, and the economy. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's many, many fields need people who can handle large scale data and understand these algorithms. And um, you know, as a result. You know, if, if you can claim to be a data scientist, it's easy to get a job. You can get a teaching job pretty much anywhere you want. Uh, you know, um, now how long is that going to last? I don't know. Again, you have to think about the Gartner hype curve. Okay. I mean, it probably won't last forever, but right now it's a great thing. And, and I, I think that data science has a lot of important things to give the world. That, you know, that there are a lot of problems that this technology solved. So I don't think the demand's ever going to go down to zero. Uh, still is, you know, I, I see it as a great thing to, to be in, if you're a young person starting out. Uh, well, if, if your question is about sort of where, where machine learning fits, I, I mean, data engineering, again, I'm not, not quite sure what data engineering means uh, as opposed to data science. That's exactly what I'm trying to find yeah. out, and I'm wondering if maybe intuitively these people have a sense of what you're saying. And they're saying that all of these professions together are data science. And that maybe you are now outlining uh, well, yeah, I'm, cer I'm certainly saying that. But whether the, you know, whether, let's say whether data science minus machine learning. I don't know what you want to call that. I, I don't. I, is that what you want to call data engineering? Well, maybe data engineering. Well, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't. But I, I mean, I don't like that because it somehow has. You know, look, I'm an engineer. Oh, we all know that engineers are outranked by scientists. Uh, you know, and I don't want to, to, to accept the position that says that all, everything in data science that isn't machine learning is somehow suspect or less important or, or trivial. Not. You know, machine, you know, to me, machine learning is just one class of algorithms, very important class, but it's just just one, one class among many of equal importance, or e sort of, of equal sophistication, let's say. But anyway, that's, that's my view. Prefer to learn a model based only on the patient with happy health. 
Um, I wonder what we do that when... Wait, oh, wait, you want to learn the model? Well, well first, it sounds like you're asking two questions. One question I thought was, is multi-class classification realistic? And I'd say yes. Look at ImageNet. Um, but the other question was, do you want to do training based on only positive examples? And that, that's apparently you know, not my field. I don't know, but I, I understand that that's, that's almost impossible, not quite impossible. Um, um, there, there are some techniques that work. Um, uh, for example, there was this, there was a study recently. Uh, uh, my colleague Yuri Leskovich was was involved in, where they um, they're looking at how judges decide to, to grant bail, and um, uh, they want they wanted to come up with an, an algorithm that looked at the characteristics of the accused and decided whether or not bail should be granted based. And what they wanted to, of course, minimize was the probability that they will not show up for their hearing, or jump bail, or commit another crime while they're out on bail. Uh, and they were able to, just using positive data, because there is only positive data, there's no data about things that didn't occur, namely the, um, the bail was not granted but they, would they have committed a crime had they been given that? There's no way to get that out like that. Um, they were able to get a, a good model, and in particular something that was about 10% more accurate than judges themselves, uh, by simply taking advantage of the fact that certain judges give bail in 90% of the cases, others only in 50% of the cases. <coughs> So the, the, you, you, have, you sort of you sort of have some um, some negative examples in the population of bail granted by the ninety percent judges that wouldn't be granted. You, you know that some of them wouldn't have been given bail uh, if they'd gone before the fifty percent judge. So so there are some tricks, but basically it's it's a very very hard problem dealing with only positive. Um, do you really think that machine learning is inherently contradicting understandability? No. Not no, not at all. But in many cases, it does. Yeah. Obviously, you cannot understand the, the very large deep learning machinery. Mm -hmm. Maybe smaller things or ones that are more uh, yeah. explicit. What methods do you use that, that you feel you can understand? 
I mean, I know Actually, they're, they're locked. My own, my own is because I wanted to understand what's going on. One of the reasons was I wanted to understand what's going on. But so what's the what, what kind of model do you want? Uh, so what I want to understand is what's going on. What kind of models do you build? Basically, it's a combination of features. I know what they are and I understand what they are. A, a linear model? Or? Uh, not exactly linear, but still. A, but I introduced the nonlinearity in a domain specific mm -hmm. way. So I, I understand where the nonlinearity comes from. But of course, it required me to build my own system and not, and not use all the huge amounts of uh, methods available. Specifically, I was, un un I was practically unable to uh, put uh, the problems that I was interested in in this uh, uh, in, in the standard uh, framework. I mean, well, um, I mean, obviously, you know, there are you know, linear models, for example, are pretty understandable. Again, as long as the, the number of variables is, is manageable, a million variables. Uh, decision trees, again, as long as it's not too deep, kind of understandable. Uh, again, this will undoubtedly be tried in European courts. They'll, they'll work out what, what's an understandable model and what this is. But there's no question that there are options. They just may not be the best options. You don't care about them. Maybe we need some ongoing to reason about them. Any more questions? Thank you very much.